because of the way things evolved at Matizzi, I think the story kind of unfolded in a way probably that none of us expected it would. Canine distemper was discovered and plague was discovered and everything changed quickly. The early detection of the, of the disease provides us with an opportunity, however slim, to try and save some individual animals from the infected area that will be added to the captive propagation effort. Hopefully this effort will allow perpetuation of the species. Since they were going to go extinct in the wild, they were rescued, brought into captivity by Wyoming Game and Fish Department. 1986 was really a, a terrible year for us. In the winter of 85, just preceding that, we'd gotten down to 10 animals in total, four in the wild, six that we had brought into captivity. But in 1986, those six did not breed, so we were thinking, some of us, that we were repeating the Patuxent experience and would end up with nothing, and instead of enhancing the conservation, we'd be enhancing the ex extinction of these animals. Scarface was a rather large, he was a big ferret, probably one of the largest ones that, that came out, and he did, he had, a, he had a scar down his face, so that's how he got his name. Our association with Scarface actually began when he was in the wild. This was in the the winter of 1986 and into the spring of 1987 where we spent a lot of time trying to catch him. We knew he was out there, but he was very difficult to find and, and even more difficult to, to catch. It's by spring of 87, we finally waited for a big snowstorm, tracked him to a burrow and set a trap on that burrow and said, we'll just we'll sit here for as long as it takes. <laughs> and it took about a week. He finally did come out and get caught. In fact, he was the last animal we, we found at Matitsi that we wanted to bring into captivity. 18 ferrets rescued from the wild. When we first brought him in, I'll just, I'll never forget because it was, it was super exciting. You, you know, the electricity in the area was like, wow, this has never been done before. This is something exciting and, you know, if anybody was going to make it work, it was going to be Tom and Beth. If we're successful in maintaining a founder group of animals for our captive breeding effort, and if they reproduce as we hope and predict they will, then, then we should within a couple of years, and, and I, I don't want to be pinned down to the number of years because we don't know how quick this will develop, uh, we should have animals for reintroduction. A lot of the credit needs to go to the folks with Wyoming Game and Fish that took the lead with captive breeding. Notably, uh, the late Tom Thorne and Beth Williams, as well as Don Kwiatkowski, who managed the Sabeel captive breeding facility. They're the ones who actually, you know, trial and error, they had to produce kits to grow that captive population. Several other partners came in, Fish and Wildlife Service, the captive breeding specialist group of the International Conservation of Nature Union, and AZA, the American Zoological Association. All these people came together, experts in captive breeding, to um, try and save the species. And everything that we did, of course, was slow, quiet, methodical. Just, there was just a lot of watching them. You know, just making sure that they would make the noise, that they would come out, they would be alert, they would eat. But yet there was a lot of unknowns. Everybody was kind of on pins and needles. You know, we knew the females were pregnant, but, but were they going to have the litter successfully? Were they going to take care of the litter? So we were elated when we got Scarface in and he immediately bred a couple females and they produced kits in 87. Once he had babies, it was like, let's raise them, let's breed them, and let's them have babies. So I think once we were over that hump and knew that it could be done, they figured out how to do it here in Wyoming, and then we spread ferrets around to other zoos. The Sabeel facility, we produced tons of ferrets up there from the late 80s to 2005 when we moved all the ferrets down to this facility. The new National Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center in northern Colorado, where we house about 70% of the world's captive stock. We have five partner zoos across North America that are breeding black-footed ferrets. Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, our first breeding season was then the spring of 1991. We have adopted what's called as adaptive management. 
with Blackfoot Affairs because nobody knows everything. So we see what works, we do some um, research, we have one facility try something with diet or with how to monitor their breeding readiness and then we can learn from that and go forward. We have a stud book. It's kind of the electronic family tree of the black-footed ferret line. And we use that and a lot of very fancy schmancy computer programs to determine what males and females get paired with each other. It's a giant computer dating service. It's such a small genetic pool from those 18 that were brought in that we try and maximize every animal so we don't lose any more genetics than we know we're gonna lose with every generation. It's a big challenge every year, just making sure that they're healthy enough to reproduce and then just tracking their progress while they're getting into breeding season. Our typical year, we start doing our male and female reproductive readiness checks in January. Black-footed ferrets are seasonal breeders, so we have to get them when they're ready to go. Ferrets are unusual, not that they are seasonal, but that they are called induced ovulators, so they will only ovulate if they are bred. So we want to make sure that it's a good match. They only really have one chance once a year, and they may only breed for four years. Once the females are biologically ready to go, and the males are too, we put that male with the female, leave them together for a couple days. Because some aren't good breeders, Dr. Jo Gale Howard from the National Zoo, she pioneered the artificial insemination of black-footed ferrets. So she worked out all the challenges there, and you can't just breed them like you do other domestic animals. You have to actually do a surgical procedure. So she takes the, the semen, can freeze it down, genome bank it, and she's actually been able to bring that animal back, the, the animal that died 20 years ago. Amazing work. Really hasn't been done in other species to the degree that we do it in black-footed ferrets. The gestation period is 42 days. We don't disturb her at all. We just turn on the closed circuit camera and we can watch to see if she'll whelp. And we watch and we watch and we watch. The average litter size is three kits. We've had here in captivity, litters range from one to 10. We really want mom to raise them. And generally, they're a great mom. Come on. Every kit is treated as if it would be released to the wild. It's definitely hands off, especially the first 21 days. We usually just check on them occasionally. We will introduce meat to them at about 26 days of age, 37 days the eyes will start opening, and then at 40 days, that's when we start introducing rodent into their diet so that they can actually get a taste of that. They have to be pretty tough, so we start them off with hamsters, and if they aren't able to do it themselves, then mom will show them how, because that is their job, to be efficient predators or else they won't make it in the wild. Usually around 64 days, we'll give them their first canine distemper vaccination. And then at 90 days of age, they can actually be separated from their mother, and then they go to preconditioning if they're being released for the wild. The overrepresented genes, those animals can go for release to the wild because it's so iffy if they'll make it in the wild. Whereas the really valuable, underrepresented, rare genes will stay in the breeding program. got the captive breeding part down. We know how to make ferrets. And we're always kind of tweaking it to make more, better, but we can certainly provide the ferrets. We can produce animals in captivity. About 175 to 200 annually can go out to reintroduction sites. Several reintroduction sites have been started. And so what we're trying to do is eventually downlist and ultimately remove the Blackfoot Ferret from the Endangered Species Act. Mm -hmm.